This is a painting um, entitled Fun Puddle, and it was 100 inches by 50 inches, was done in 1991. And it was my first use of brain imagery in my work. I had done woodcuts of brains down the center of the painting, but I longed for a different type of space to be evident. Um, these brain scans came from a book uh, in the Biosciences Library at UC Berkeley where I had just come to teach. Um, I had become aware of Michael Talbot's The Holographic Universe that posited that our brains function like holograms. Um, small abstract holograms are embedded in the surface of the painting. I was very unsuccessful at communicating anything about the holographic paradigm, but it started me on this particular journey. I continued working with brain imagery through my series of paintings that were based on the Chinese Taoist text, The Secret of the Golden Flower. This painting is entitled Stopping and Seeing, which refers to a metaphor used to suggest the moment of awakening. Also at this time, I began employing Solomon Seals in my work in response to a show that I did concerning luck in Thailand. Um, they are visual interpretations of the medieval manuscript, the Limageddon. The text contains seals attributed to King Solomon, the king of Jerusalem. The wise leader found in the Bible, the Talmud, and the Quran. He was a hunchback. His wealth and fame were said to be the result of magic. These seals allegedly represent the spirits that he harnessed to achieve his worldly and spiritual power. These spirits were used to answer questions, provide assistance, and were essentially conduits for desire. This is the spirit Nabarius and he restores lost dignities and honors. This is a painting called Aldrich Ames, and it was done in 1995, and it's 84 inches by 72 inches. Uh, this painting brings up the double spy that was responsible for the deaths of many U.S. spies. It was at a time I was going up for tenure, and the whole process reminded me of the CIA. <laughs> <laughs> All the black imagery that you see um, and in particular, all the little uh, pinpoints of light are Russian nuclear tests from CIA satellite photos. Down the middle of the painting, underneath the muslin, are Solomon seals that pertain to conquering one's enemies. At the time, I was living on top of Alameda's Alameda County's largest bingo hall, and I saw bingo cards as I walked my dogs every day as records of ill luck, not dissimilar to Aldrich Ames. So all those little circles, tiny circles behind the muslin are evidence of the stamping of the bingo cards. This painting is called A Facility of Speech. It's 108 by 85 inches. Six years after Fun Puddle, and six years after I began to use brain imagery, 
I had a cerebral hemorrhage. I like to say it took a while for my life to catch up with my art. <laughs> it came out of the blue uh, during a graduate critique. Within two minutes, I wasn't able to talk, to walk, to read. My entire right side was paralyzed and cognitively, I was severely impaired. I was one of the lucky ones because six out of 10 people that have cerebral hemorrhages uh, pass away. Coincidentally, I was very depressed as are 85% of stroke survivors. Six months later, I had a, what is known as a cerebral angiogram that, to determine whether or not I would need brain surgery. A cerebral angiogram is a process by which they put a catheter uh, in your hip and then thread it up to the top of your heart. Um, then start taking uh, pictures um, as it goes through the brain. So it is um, only the arterial system, not uh, the black and, and white sections that we saw before. Um, when, I, when this procedure was over, I looked up at the monitor and saw these fascinating images of blood in my brain, and I knew instantly that they would be incorporated into my paintings. I stopped and said to all the people in the room, uh, I need those images. And for some reason, they began to laugh. And I said, that's just fine. Um, and uh, for some reason, they began to laugh. And I said, no, no, I'm very serious. I need those images. Um, right at that point, the um, doctor uh, walked out of the room with a full set of uh, uh, images from my uh, cerebral angiogram and he, instead of waiting for two weeks like I was used to for every single test, he gave me the verdict that I was okay. So I knew that um, these represented a very positive uh, point in my life and I began incorporating them. <coughs> The name of this painting is Pump, Drug, and Computer. Um, it is 84 by 108 and was done in 2006. It refers to the baclofen pump I had implanted in my stomach to deliver a drug to my spinal fluid and thus allow me to walk. I often joke with my colleagues that are in, um, teaching digital media that they might know a lot about computers, but I am the only one in the room that has one inside my stomach. Here the cerebral angiograms are incorporated with a 16th century image of the nervous system done by Andreas Vesalius. The revolutionary anatomist that changed the course of Western medicine. In today's medical imaging technology, the role of the artist is eliminated. The digital process ostensibly avoids intervention the human hand, and the craftsmanship of printmakers. What happens when the artist comes at the end of this process instead of in the middle? When the emphasis is on interpretation rather than observation 
or imitation. This is uh, the Solomon Seal Salos that I use quite often. Um, it's represented in this painting called Vesalius's Pump. Salos arouses desire and stimulates passion. Vesalius's brains are stitched together with my arteries. It is funny because before the stroke, I loathed cracks. I taught materials and methods of painting, and I would often see a student with a cracked painting, and I would think, oh my goodness, that poor student does not know how to paint. Then after my stroke, I changed uh, materials to try to detoxify my process as much as possible. So I changed from an all oil process to one using acrylic and oil, I mean, excuse me, acrylic and latex paint with an oil glaze at the end. Um, all of a sudden, it started to crack. And after that, I began to relish them and saw them as an apt metaphor for our aging bodies. This large painting is called Fist, 62 by 85, done in 2008. Um, it, it is a self-portrait in homage to the intelligence of my right hand. It is as if my body occupies the bottom half of the painting with me lying on my back with an abstracted arm jutting out, ending with a fist of many brains. My right hand now senses fear, pain, and grief by forming a tighter fist before I can consciously register those emotions. There are approximately 100 billion neurons inside of our bodies. This six foot square painting illustrates just one of them. It is taken from a drawing from the Spanish anatomist Santiago Ramon y Cajal. He wanted to be an artist, but his doctor father, anatomist father, wouldn't allow it. So instead, he did become a doctor and he won the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 1906 for his drawings of individual reticulated neurons. After my last show in 2008, I had a painting block that painfully lasted nine months. One morning in a reverie, upon awakening, I had a vision of a diptych with a long skirt attached. It seemed silly um, at best, but I, I, since I had nothing else was coming up, I thought, why not try it? I worked on this series entitled Healers from the Yelling Clinic from 2010 to 2012. The Yelling Clinic is an art and disability collective that I co-founded. We are particularly focused on war, uh, military pollution, 
and how these impact disabled people globally. This is at uh, Ed Roberts campus above the Ashby BART station where um, most of the nonprofits that have to do with disability are located. And here are a few of the um, healers from the Yelling Clinic. Um, you know, I neurologically can't tell my left from my right, even though I know that this side is paralyzed. But it was a problem I had, you know, when I was born. So this one is called Ali, and th that one over there is called Belly. Um, this one is called Neuron Nurse. And this other one is called Dr. Mansour, after the 14th century Persian anatomist. Uh, this one is called Yellow Jar Con Clinician, and the other one is called Hoyan Healer. Um, these last two paintings were done after the Yelling Clinic went to Vietnam to meet with survivors of Agent Orange, which has now affected three generations of Vietnamese. Um, their skirts are made from Vietnamese silk. This is a series that I'm currently working on entitled Venuses. They are reclining nudes adopted from Western painters with brains as heads. They are on the linen backs of reproductions of iconic paintings uh, pieced together. Uh, this one is called Olympia, after Manet's master priest, and it is approximately 78 by 89 inches. This uh, one is called Maiha, Meha, um, and it's after Francisco Goya. I became part of disability studies at Cal uh, 12 years ago and developed my course Art, Medicine, and Disability, where we look at how artists have responded to disability and illness. Our topics range across many disabilities, for example, deafness, <coughs> visual impairments, autism, cancer, cystic fibrosis, and mental illness. I'm going to talk about three women artists that were in middle inst um, mental institutions. But first, uh, but this first slide is of, by the French artist Jean Dubuffet, who founded Art Brut in 1945. He was an insider in the Parisian art world and prone to ape the style of many of the artists he found uh, uh, of art brute. Agnes Richter was a seamstress who was institutionalized against her will in the early 1890s. She embroidered every inch of her jacket with a mysterious autobiographical text. <clears throat> she spent her days transforming a mental institution's uniform, the symbol of her depersonalization, into a profoundly personal record of her journey. She transformed something institutional and distant into something intimate, obsessive, and possessive.
Richter has embroidered the garment so intensely that reading it is impossible in certain areas. Words appear and disappear into seams and under layers of thread. <coughs> there is no beginning or end, just spirals of intersecting fragmentary narratives. She is declarative. I, mine, my jacket, my white stockings. In the inside, she has written 1894, I am, I, today, woman. Barbara Suckville, a farmer's wife, started to hear voices at the age of 50. In 1910, under their command, she began to draw outlines of dishes and cutlery. Writing along and in between the outlines, Sockville captures in words her everyday life in the Heidelberg Asylum. What she thought, did, or ate, her rose with the nurses and what the voices told her. Every word is followed by a full stop, resulting in a dense net of marks that dissolves into abstraction. All of Suckfield's drawings, which have an obvious aerial perspective, depict the domestic objects that were brought into her cell. There is no three-dimensional space, and each flattened object is outlined with a succession of twos, crosses, or pinpricks, which form chains in an attempt to establish boundaries. Suckfield's life ended in 1933, when many of these artists were rounded up by the Nazis so they could first try out their death machines on the disabled population. <clears throat> In her 1975 manifesto, Struggles and Wanderings of My Soul, Yayo Kasuma describes a life of recurring hallucinations that drove her to paint and generated her practice of what she calls, quote, obsessional art, end quote. <clears throat> she wrote that it saved her from total despair and probable suicide. Kusama called her work, quote, art medicine, end quote. <clears throat> because it allowed her to have some control over her extreme anxieties, and also because the activity involved was in itself healing. <coughs> Kusama came to New York in the early 60s with the ambition to become an artist of international stature. She came with her drawings packed in suitcases of 500 drawings that she lived with uh, for the time she was in New York. Um, she brought also 2,000 small works on paper. Some of these watercolors and drawings use the polka dot and net motifs that remained in her later work. The infinity net paintings that developed from them seemed to have offered Kusama a sense of control, as if by recreating the patterns she had some power over their appearance 
and activity. Within 18 months after arriving, she had radically transformed her work, eventually reflecting the influence of pop, uh, minimalism, and performance art movements. Far from being an outsider during her years in New York, she was the consummate art world insider and very well known in Europe. This photograph is of a performance she conducted outside of the New York stock market. Kusama's <coughs> illness has also helped to shape her creative process. She explains, while others might not be able to tolerate the monotonous labor long enough to complete only a square foot of one of her large canvases, her mental condition gives her the stamina and the focus to cover huge surfaces with intricate, repetitive patterning. This lent itself to Kusama's interest in depicting the suggestion of infinity. Uh, Catherine, you need to fast forward a little bit. Okay, I have, I have two more to finish. Um, uh, at the end of the 60s, she moved back to Japan and checked herself into a mental hospital which specialized in art therapy. She remains there in, in her 80s and picked up every day to go to her studio. Um, she is extremely successful artist in major museums around the world. She, is she an outsider or an insider? She collaborates with the likes of Louis Vuitton. This is her installation um, at Selfridge's department store in London. Thank you.